So there's a misconception that if you're single, you are incomplete, perhaps damaged, salvaged, and you won't be happy until you find your one. And that is not true. That is bullshit. It is a message that has been fed to us by media and advertising. The truth is, when you're single, you have the richest soil for growth. That's why I created this podcast. And unlike other podcasts, this one is host-driven, not guest-driven. That means I will be rotating health and wellness experts three times a week to give you the giant box of wellness crayons, not just the primary colors, so you can start building a meaningful life. It's time to give singlehood a cape. Today's host is Rena Martin. She was a Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney for 14 years, where she specialized in sex crimes, child abuse, and domestic violence cases. Today, she continues to serve women as an intimacy coach, educator, TEDx speaker, and author with a mission and a fire in her belly to help women love their bodies, experience deep intimacy, and of course, have great sex, all shame-free. Enjoy, Rena Martin. I am your host today, women's intimacy coach, Rena Martin, and I am joined by certified holistic health coach, Kat Kierens. Kat specializes in somatic healing for stress and anxiety and is passionate about embodiment. With a following of over, over 30,000 people on TikTok, Kat's mission since day one has been to help women feel safe in their bodies so they can live up to their fullest potential. She takes a trauma-informed approach and infuses knowledge from her basic somatic experiencing certificate, her background in assertive communication, as well as her energetic gifts to help her followers and clients find peace. Kat, how are you, woman? Hi, Rena. I am so good and so excited to be chatting with you, as I always am excited to talk with you. Thank you. Well, for I am honored to have you here today, especially because like you're kind of out on maternity leave, <laughs> maternity leave right now, right? <laughs> it's true. I am uh, about 10 weeks away from popping, so I have stepped away from uh, from working too much, but I couldn't help it. I, when you reached out to me about this topic, I was like, oh, this sings to me. I have to talk to Rena about this. So uh, yes. by all means, yeah. Well, I'm so excited to have you and thank you for carving out some time for, for our talk today. Um, let's just start big picture here. Say someone's listening and they have no idea what um, some somatic or embodiment refers to. Can you just kind of walk us through that? Yeah, for sure. So my lens is definitely from a holistic lens, but I infuse a heavy side of somatic healing and embodiment work, which essentially just means how we regulate the nervous system so that we can find our own sense of peace, of regulation, of centeredness. And we do this through exercises that are really body focused instead of mind focused. Now, because I come from a holistic lens as well, I don't think that we are ever mindless or that it's not all connected. I truly believe it is all connected, but it's kind of like the gateway into being able to calm our mind if it's kind of gone haywire into anxiety and stress mode. Um, and I believe that if we can connect to our body and regulate our nervous systems so that we can even just take a deep breath and be really present with ourselves that we're going to be able to reduce our stress and our anxiety. So that's the lens that I come from when I'm working with clients and also sharing online. Got it. And so how, how would one know if their nervous system is off? <laughs> yeah, I would say it's different for a lot of people, um, but there are many, many cues and when it comes to anxiety, for instance, generally speaking, people are going to have a trouble accessing a slow and steady breath. They're going to feel maybe really sweaty or all of a sudden flush. They might feel dizzy. Um, and this is, this is, again, from the anxious side. There's also different ways you can be reg dysregulated, but it could even be people describe it as anxiety attacks or panic attacks where you quite literally feel like you might be dying um, in those moments. So that's kind of on the extreme end, but the subtle ends could literally just be like feeling um, a, a complete lack of centeredness. Like you're not feeling 
connected or uh, you can't connect to other people or have a calm conversation, you're, you're just distant. You're not there. You're not in your body. So I would say that there's going to be different subtle cues for everybody. Like for myself, when I'm really anxious, all of a sudden I'm going to not be able to have access to my breath. And then I'm literally going to have it, uh, a headache come in almost instantly. That's just my body's um, kind of warning sign. And then I actually, this is years ago, I don't, I'm luckily don't have this anymore, but I would go straight to vomiting actually. So there's lots of different warning signs. And I would just say that like everybody's, everybody's different. Um, So to just to get used to what feels off, what feels not calm. Yeah. And isn't that amazing how, how connected our, our minds and bodies are, I was actually having a conversation with some friends over the weekend about when I was first diagnosed with anxiety. And this was many, many years ago. And I was having pain in my chest. I was super nauseous and I was getting tingling in, in my fingers. Like Mm -hmm. it felt like pins and needles, my fingers, but the stomach stuff was in the chest pain. It was really alarming to me. And they did all of these invasive tests. Um, and eventually my general practitioner is like, good news. You're not dying. You just have anxiety. kind of thing. <laughs> Right. And, and so now though, when I see, when I see these symptoms manifest, I'm like, oh, that's just my anxiety. And I, and I have my toolbox that I use to manage that. But, um, but so often we, we don't understand the signals that, that our body's trying to give us. Right. Yeah. Or we ignore them because our bodies has never been technically a safe place for us to be, you know, for many different reasons for so many people. So we just ignore yeah. it and say like, oh, maybe that's normal. Or we put it up to something we ate that day, or we just think, ah, like I've always had this, but our bodies are so intelligent, right? Like the wisdom that is there, I think, I think is underappreciated. So if we can tap into it, that's embodiment. I mean, we're all embodied no matter what, but it's the conscious awareness to become in our body that I would describe as true embodiment. Right. Being really present. So is there, yeah, like, is there a scanning process that you can recommend people do? How, how do you listen to what your body's saying? Mm, Yeah. I personally, what I love to do, and, and again, because I work one-on-one with people, I find and what I found over the years is that everybody is different. And I, I would love to be able to give a blanket statement for everybody, but I, I just can't. So I'll speak from what I love to do, which is literally just bringing my hand over my heart and over my stomach. And it's a little different now that I'm pregnant. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's a whole new <laughs> learning curve. But, and I just take a couple of, of breaths Um, And just notice how I'm breathing. So I don't change my breath in that moment. I just go, okay, where is it? Am I taking deep belly belly breaths or am I really shallow in my chest? So I I first use the breath as kind of the entrance point into figuring out where my body is at. And then from there, yeah, I might do a scan. I might start from the top of my head and quite literally do a scan and just say, where am I off right now? Um, But I would say that I just like to start simple and just stop take a deep breath, put my hand on my body and just go, how am I breathing? And then if I need to have that change, I have the possibility of inviting maybe a deeper belly breath in or doing another somatic practice. And I know that that one thing I've seen you doing quite a bit on, on TikTok and on Instagram is, is dancing and kind of moving around. Heck yeah. And I know, I, I know that. sometimes you, you, you bring your partner in for that too. And I do want to pivot into how anxiety affects relationships, but, but before getting to that, like using movement, not only to benefit yourself, but as a way to connect with your partner, can you, can you tell us what the good benefits are of doing that? Mm, absolutely. I mean, for solo dance, it's, it's a release. I think of it as, you know, akin to one of the somatic practices that I also love is just, it's called shaking. It's nothing fancy. It's literally what you hear. 
and it can start in the hands and then it can move to your whole body. And what the theory behind shaking is, is that it's completing a stress response. So if your body is all of a sudden in fight, flight, freeze, it might be really activated. And so your body needs to complete the stress response by just letting go the energy that's in the body. So shaking is very akin to dancing. Dancing just happens to be to a beat. And I am a trained dancer. So I, that's what I love to do. And I usually incorporate some shaking into that practice, both as like a preventative measure for stress and anxiety, but also as a relief. So I use it as both. Um, and then when you bring in another partner into it, it, it adds a whole other element, right? It's, um, it can be a co-regulating. It can be a way to bring in humor and laughter and lightness. And then not only that, but like just, I mean, we all know that music affects our mood. So as long as you're choosing uh, a song that might connect you to the present moment and bring you to this, to the current place, then you world's your oyster in that moment, right? You can connect, <laughs> yes. you can play, you can have so much fun. Um, I actually, in my, my own spare time, in one of my hobbies, and it hasn't been for the last, you know, seven months since I've been pregnant, well, maybe five months, because I did for a couple of months at the beginning, is a dance called contact dance, which is not actually something that I share online. It's more of an intimate type of dance. Um, and essentially what you're doing in that dance is you're leaning on one another and you're using each other's body weight to move in flow. So there's no choreography or anything like that, but it is very intimate and it's very connective. And all of a sudden you are not only connecting to your own body through movement, but you're also connecting to another person or maybe even multiple people um, if it's in like a group context, the stance class. Mm. Um, and that has been a really great uh, gateway into just understanding anxiety and intimacy, because even though it's not sexual per se, it is very intimate. It's a very intimate yeah. dance. So that's not what I share online, but it's something personally that has been a really interesting um, evolution in my own sexuality and, and as it relates to, to anxiety. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I definitely want to dive deeper in that. But you you mentioned um, completing a, a stress response or a stress cycle. And I know that we we are able to complete the stress cycles and the stress response in a bunch of different ways. Um, one of them being the 20 second hug. Have you heard about this? Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. but I'm not sure about if it's in the same context. That I, I'm assuming it's the same one. Yeah, that, that if you, yeah, if you um, hug a person, whether that be your partner or someone else, if you're in the middle of, of a stress response, that hugging somebody where your center of gravity um, remains constant, so you're not actually leaning up against them, but it's a tight embrace for 20 seconds, that that has the same calming effect on your body as something like jogging two miles. Mm. Um which, which, when you mention this, this um, <clears throat> notion of contact dancing, right, where you are skin to skin in that way, where you are feeling held, and it's this symbiotic relationship, it it makes complete sense to me why not only it would feel intimate, but would also lower lower your stress levels too. One hundred percent. It's just, uh, you know, as soon as you said skin to skin, of course, right now I'm going through all of this kind of mothering uh, transition. And one of the suggestions is that as soon as your baby is born, you go straight to skin to skin, right? Which then releases mm -hmm. oxytocin, which they call you know, the love hormone, I think. And so this, I, it totally makes sense. Like we're not that different from when we're little babies, when we're feeling anxiety and stress, we want to we jet, not everybody, but generally speaking, we want to be held. It makes so much sense to just like have someone to, that we can lean on. And so, yeah, the 20 second hug makes total sense. Um, and I often say to my clients, it's like so many of them are coming to me to be able to kind of like self-help and do it mm -hmm. on their own. And one thing that I almost always say is like, you, this isn't to be done on your own. Like we need other people in order to regulate ourselves. We're, we're creatures of belonging, of community. And so I love that you brought that up because I don't think we have to do it on our own. Sometimes that's the only option and 
that's okay to work from. But um, if we can move towards that connection too, it's, I think it's the ideal. Yeah. And and so in your experience um, as a, as a somatic and holistic anxiety coach, how do you see the interplay between anxiety and, and sex as, as it shows up in your line of work? Mm, yeah, I see it from, from both angles. Um, and what I mean by both angles is I see it as the stress, and the anxiety causing issues with sex. And I also see it from the, the angle of sex causing stress and anxiety. I would say that more often than not, when clients come to me and it comes up, that it's coming from the place of um, a stressful life is then causing difficulties connecting to their own bodies and to their partner's bodies. Um, mm -hmm. So, but that being said, myself and my own journey would be the other option where it's like the anxiety comes from the sex. So it comes from both. I'm not sure. I mean, you do, I'll, you do a lot more work in this probably than I do specifically because this isn't the highlight of my work. It does come up with yeah. almost all my clients, but not all of them. Um, but I see it from both those places. Yeah. And, and I think, um, I, I echo that too. I see it coming from both places, um, in the former category, it will appear in ways like I can't get out of my head during sex. Mm -hmm. Um, I am spectatoring. That's usually not the term they use. That's the term I use, which is mm -hmm. this idea of I am looking at my own body from like another place in the room. I'm right. analyzing my own body from an outsider's point of view, which by definition means that you're not present in your own body mm -hmm. as that's happening. And then I see the other side of it, which is um, perhaps there are mismatched libidos or desire going on in a relationship mm -hmm. that's causing a lot of anxiety. Like, are we going to stay together? What's going on? Can we salvage this? Or um, working with, with women who are trauma survivors, where mm -hmm. there is literally a, a traumatic response that happens during intimacy. And so if we're talking about the former category um, with women who struggle to remain present in their bodies um, during sex because perhaps they've got a lot going on in their minds or they're, they're looking at and, and criticizing their own body and spectatoring, are there any sort of practical tips that, that women can use in the moment that you would recommend? Mm. Yeah, it's a good distinction of in the moment versus preemptively. So in the moment, I would definitely suggest, well, I have a couple of suggestions, actually. Maybe I'll start first with ensuring that we are connected to the senses. So whenever there is the noticing, oh, I'm not in my body, which is has to be one of the first steps. Oh, here I am looking down at myself, watching myself. Then we can go, okay, I've noticed that. How can I connect to my five senses here? And I would can I would I would want someone to take this practice and actually do it in anticipation in anticipation of becoming sexual. But let's say they haven't. What I would get them to do is connect to the sounds they're hearing, connect to the scent, connect to what they see, connect to, you know, how they're feeling, like what the bedspread feels like. So just coming back into like literally their senses. Um, when I was doing some um, training with um, another coach who's a um, um, Tantra t coach, uh, this was in the summer, they had we've been talking a lot about making sure that we even just set ourselves up for those things to make it easier to stay in our body. So we might light a candle, we might turn on the music, we might do all of these things to make sure that it's easier to come back to those senses so that we actually enjoy those senses, right? Because if you haven't prepped the place, maybe the, the, 
the smell isn't good, right? And all of these different things. So, or there is no discernible smell, and you're like exactly stressing about trying to find one. You're like, wait, was that a smell? Yeah, that a smell? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, keeping in mind that this is like, can you prepare for it? You're not always going to be preparing for sex, right? So that's okay. So, if you're not, another one that I absolutely love, and again, I want to preface this by saying, every single woman that I work with, I give them many, many options for different somatic Mm -hmm. exercises when they're dealing with anxiety. Some hit, some don't. It's just the way it is. Like whether that's where you're at in your life or it's um, a sense of shame that comes from doing that exercise or whatever. But one of the best ones that I love, and it's kind of funny to do is, you know, whether you're having anxiety by yourself or with partner or partners is the sound release exercise, which is literally just something like, so like letting your, (laughs) your mouth go and just giving yourself a moment to, and you know, if you don't want to do the horse lips, you can just take a nice deep breath with a big sigh to give yourself Mm. that moment of like, okay, can I connect to it? And for the most part, a sigh can feel sexy. So it's a nice, it's a little bit different from the horse lips, I would say. Too, yeah. That one doesn't fit you. <laughs> you know, I like to bring humor into my sex life. So that's why it can be okay there, but not everyone does. So maybe just like a, uh, you know, just a moment to come back into your body. Um, yes. But, you know, when it comes down to it, one of the things, if my anxiety for instance, is really high in the moment, I might actually stop and just give my hands a little shake, you know, like take a moment to release the anxiety from my body and to come back into embodiment. And I would say that the one thing that stops us from doing these things, I would say that they are actually inherently instinctual, but our society thinks they're weird. So we Mm -hmm. don't do them. Like shaking is a very normal practice that mammals do. Like to, to release stress, but humans don't because it looks weird. (laughs) And we don't make sounds when we exhale because it's weird. And so we have all of this shame wrapped around being in our bodies and making noise and taking up space. So I would say like the best thing that could go along with that would be even to have a conversation with the person or people that you're having sex with prior to it so that it doesn't Mm -hmm. feel weird. If all of a sudden you start doing like, (sighs) or something. Right? <laughs> that, might not, that might not go for everyone. So um, yeah, that's kind of a mix there, I guess, of preparing yourself and also being in the moment. So. Oh, and I, I love what you discussed in terms of preemptively setting yourself up for success in the mm-hmm. room mm-hmm. Um, to the extent that, that you can, where it's not just like, hey, super, super spontaneous, let's do it up against the kitchen counter kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, giving yourself um, something to look at, something to listen to, something to smell. One thing that I, um, like a very easy hack that I'll, that I'll tend to give folks where they're like, my mind is wandering, is um, just come back to wherever you're feeling pleasure in your body. Um, That's something that, that I implement myself. And it's kind of like meditating. When you first start meditating, your mind is going to wander and they say, just come back to the breath (laughs) Um, that I, that I personally love just, okay, if my mind starts to wander, come back to wherever I'm feeling sensation and pleasure on my body in the moment. But I, I, I feel like, what I'm hearing you say is, is activating your connection to your body. And here's a whole buffet of ways that you can do that. Find what works for you and leave what doesn't. 100%. And (laughs) don't feel like it's just because you try something like you might go online and go onto my TikTok page or find someone else's or anything and look at a bunch of the exercises that are there. And you might try five that just don't do anything for you. And I would just say, like, don't give up because sometimes the thing that gets in the way is just the shame of doing them. And it's just, yeah. and, I, and, and I know your connection to the word shame. <laughs> we don't like it, <laughs> right? We don't. Shame is no. bad. It's yucky. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so say we're talking about that, that latter co- category where the stress and anxiety that's happening outside the bedroom is pushing down on your brakes 
sexually speaking, to where your libido and your sex drive is just like non-existent. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you begin to to tackle that? You know, again, I'll kind of come at it from my own perspective. I think it's probably best to share that. Um, is <laughs> I like the three M's. So I like to make sure that I connect to movement, meditation, and masturbation. Mm. And if I can carve out time to give that to myself, to gift it to myself, which has been a whole journey of shame, uh, even just connecting to my own body in from a pleasure lens has been difficult um, and has been a whole saga, let's say. Um, but if we can just do it in little bite-sized chunks, like it, it doesn't have to be a half an hour episode. It can be, you know, can I dance to 30 seconds of a song and then can I sit down for two breaths and then can I just connect with my body in a sensual way from like a deep sense of desire for pleasure, right? So maybe that's just, you know, connecting to your stomach or to your breasts or, you know, to your vulva, like whatever it might be to just give yourself the the time and the space to 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 actually practice by yourself and and that comes from from my lens of being too busy and uh my story is that I was classically busy four jobs never stopped and the last thing on my list was my sexuality always for for years and years yeah. and years and years and years and I think that that's super truthful to so many women um, I would say, especially for women uh, that are, you know, also have kids to take care of or dependents or whatever that might be, is this like impending stress that comes with it. And this lack of, um, I guess, permission to be sexual. Mm -hmm. And I would say that like, it, not only is it permissible, but it's necessary. And so if we can look at it like a self-care practice or like a doctor's um, prescription of like, no, these things are necessary for my overall well-being, then that might take some of the shame away from it or it might take some of the, um, it might bump it up a couple notches on your to-do list, you know? Yeah. And and you bring up a few things that, that I talk about often. And one is that you can't enjoy sex if you're viewing it as a chore, right? And mm. I like to say, instead of viewing this as an item on your to-do list, view this as an escape from the to-do list. Mm, instead I of this that. being, I need to go buy groceries, this is, no, I'm going to a really nice restaurant. <laughs> and, But I think that that can be hard. I mean, in some ways, that's much easier said than done, especially mm -hmm. if we're stressed our partner's stressed and we're just kind of having mediocre sex. You're like, well, Hey Rita, this doesn't sound like a fancy restaurant to me. This sounds like a seven <laughs> 11 ham sandwich. But, <sighs> but I think reestablishing, um, your connection to pleasure. And I love that you suggested just doing this in these kind of micro beats that it doesn't have to be that all of a sudden you're having a solo dance party, that you've become some <laughs> meditative guru and that you're having an hour long self-pleasure session no. um, that, that we can start in baby steps. Um, I, I will also throw out there how beneficial orgasms are for us, whether you're having those alone or with a partner, they help reduce cortisol levels. So they reduce stress levels. They help you sleep. Um, they help with pain relief. They actually help your skin. Um, they have some anti-aging properties. Like basically orgasms are the free multivitamin that actually feels really good. Mm -hmm. So I'm just throwing out yet another reason why um, pleasure is a, a, can be a huge and um, really beneficial part of your overall wellness practice. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's reminding me of a book I read and maybe you've heard of it. It's called Patriarchy Stress Disorder. It's by Dr. No. Valerie Stein or Steen. Um, and I loved it. I read it a couple of years ago and it's just like this book that's about all of the pressures that women go through and they, they 
they inherit from just being in our culture and our society and how it just, it's, it's the reason that we're so stressed. It's because we add on all of these things and we feel like we can never really connect with ourselves. And so even though, and this, this lens comes from like, uh, kind of like, here's the successful woman and yet she doesn't actually feel like she's enjoying her life. Like she's got all of these things in a row and yet she's lacking something. And it comes from this patriarchy stress disorder as she, as she coins it. But, um, it just reminds me that like, even if you're stressed and you're doing all of these things and you're doing these micro moments of connecting with your body, there's still the obvious conversation that needs to happen about like, what are you putting on your plate (laughs) and Mm -hmm. how can you make sure that you are also detoxing and delegating and saying no and setting boundaries? right? Because you can't just be like, oh, okay, I can do it all now. And I'm going to add another thing to my to-do list, just like you were saying. Sometimes we have to knock things off the to-do list in order for us to even have the capacity to be able to connect with ourselves. So like, I just don't want to go without saying that important piece is like, sometimes we just have to, we have to say no. And I talk to so many people who feel like they can't say no to things. And that breaks my heart. Yeah. 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 And, but, and I, I really appreciate you pointing out that there is a systemic anxiety to being a woman mm-hmm. and that, that is uniquely feminine. Um, and, and the book that you mentioned reminds me of a, another book that I'll recommend if people want to go down this rabbit hole, that's called fuck happiness by Ariel Gore. Mm-hmm. And it is so fascinating because they look at all of this research based on what, what it means to be a happy woman Mm. and that we, for a long time, were rewarded for doing everything. We were supposed to keep the household together. We were supposed to be the one to make the big smiley, fun faces at kids' birthday parties. And Mm -hmm. now, um, as men's happiness has increased over time, ours has actually gone down. They talk about the history of antidepressants, which basically was that they were made for a uniquely feminine disorder, which explains why women tend to be twice as depressed as men. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that, um, that we do need to remind people that to some extent, these can just be band-aids that we're putting on a problem that, that has a deeper root cause. And if we can't go ahead and wave the magic wand and change our society and our structure overnight, then perhaps what we can do on the individual level is to start saying no and kind of saying, fuck you to the system in the smallest ways we possibly can. Yep. Yep. 100%. Like, and and in so many different ways, I noticed the people around me saying yes to every little thing, having no boundaries, full calendars. And I'm also speaking from my own personal experience um, and that being an issue that I've consistently had. And, And knowing that as soon as my schedule is too full, I don't feel sexy anymore. It's like, that's what, what I think the feminine energy needs is space, is movement, is surrender. And we have becoming in, and I mean this from an energetic standpoint, like the feminine masculine energies, which is in everybody, we have become increasingly on the masculine side of energetics, right? So getting shit done, doing the stuff, like accomplishing, da, 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 da. But if we want to surrender and to be in the feminine, which again, any gender can be, is that that's what we need more of. And it's so hard to be there because we're not praised to be there. We're praised when we get stuff done. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough place to come from. And I'm glad that we're having it. It's not just like, what can I do? It's also, how can I think about this as a bigger issue? Yeah. Yeah. And how can we kind of leave our masculine hat at the door, assuming that we're spending our day job in a traditionally masculine energy role as more Mm -hmm. women are now. Mm -hmm. And how do I leave that at the door and then come home and, and surrender into a place of just being. And I'm seeing that more and more women now and the data supports this, that more and more women are having 
sexual surrender fantasies precisely because it is so divergent from who we are in our lives outside of the bedroom now. Oh, wow. That just gave me shivers. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that makes so much sense. Yeah. And, yes, and the we, longing we for We want that to be extra. dominated in the bedroom. Yeah. We don't want to have to make decisions. We're like, oh my gosh, really? Can't, can't someone else just make a decision around here right now? Yes. Oh my gosh. I was talking to a, a, another, uh, a mom friend last night and she was like, she was, you know, going about this, this, uh, classic thing that her partner says, and I've heard other women echo it. That's like, they come home and they have all of this like beautiful intention to want to help around with the kids or the house or whatever. And they ask the question, what can I do to help? Which sounds in theory so fantastic, but if you're at a lens where all of a sudden you're like, wait, is this all my job and you're just helping me just set someone mm. off into a whole tizzy. So anyways, I was just Ooh. laughing at that yesterday where you're like, yeah, no, it's not just, I'm not in charge of everything, this whole household, everything, like this is a team thing. So yeah, anyways. Yeah. So, so say, um, we've got a relationship where one person has anxiety and the other person doesn't, uh, like my relationship, for example, mm -hmm. um, I, I have my own ways of communicating what anxiety means to me, what that looks like to me, uh, to my partner, he has ADHD. And so he's over the four years we've been together, been able to kind of communicate to me here. Here's how my brain works a little bit differently, but mm -hmm. what, what tips or pieces of advice would you give to somebody who, who suffers from high stress and anxiety as they're entering into relationships on how to communicate, like, Hey, this is kind of what I need. Maybe it is like, Hey, uh, when we have sex, I might need to <laughs> shake my arms a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. how, how do you have that conversation? Yeah. Um, I would say the hardest part of this is just that I'm just going to say, you just have to talk, <laughs> which yeah. so many, I talked to so many of my girlfriends and it's like, they're so open, uh, sexually in so many ways, but then to have the actual conversations, not like, what are you into and what turns you on, but like, how do we navigate when things don't go the way we think they're going to go? Or how do we mm. come back to connection when it's ruptured in some way? Like kind of the, the, the messier conversations, um, are oftentimes harder to have, at least I found with women in my world. Um, so I would say is have the conversations and, and be okay with not knowing and trying things out. So for instance, you might be, this might be a new relationship or an old relationship where you're just starting to have these conversations with someone. And you might be like, I don't know if I need to be alone for a second or if I need co-regulation with like a hug. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So let's try out for a couple of weeks or a couple of months when I get dysregulated and we're having sex and all of a sudden I'm in my head or I'm starting to like panic or whatever it might be. I would really like us to try for you to just stop doing whatever you're doing and just open your arms and say like, come here, like, let me give you a hug. And testing yeah. out that, because unless you know, some people listening might know what they need in that moment, which is great. So then just tell them what you need. It's like, I need just a moment to take a deep breath, to stop touching. Um, or I need you to just hold me really, really tight and let me cry into your arms. Whatever the thing might be, allowing yourself to practice and to experiment with if it works or not. Because not only might it have worked with another partner, but it might not work with this partner, right? So. And not only that, but you might start off with a, uh, um, I said, I almost said a client, I guess it could be, um, but you start off <laughs> with a partner and then a couple years later, like in my relationship, you might need an upgrade. <laughs> what my, th our therapist is saying, you need an upgrade, which is just essentially like, okay, this worked X, Y, Z worked three years ago and now it's not working. So what are we going to do now? So being open to the fact that it can be changing and, and different. So conversation first and foremost has to happen. Like it has to, it, you can't not have the conversation in my personal opinion. Um, yeah. I'm and with then, you on that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> usually the, <laughs> the first question I ask, I ask people, especially if I get, you know, a DM from somebody on Instagram, 
how can I do X, Y, Z in, in my relationship? And it's like, have you had this conversation with your partner? Right. Well, no, because, and it's like, <laughs> oh, I wish I could give you a hack, but, but really there is, there is no hack. No, there is no hack. you have to communicate. Yeah. And then I guess from the other lens to what I would say, Rena, is, is the, from the somatic lens. So if your partner is experiencing anxiety, they also, if possible, if they can be a regulated space holder, then it's going to make it so much easier for the other person. So oftentimes what happens is when someone, and I'm talking attachment styles real quick here, if someone is anxiously attached and, you know, there's lots of different differing opinions on attachment styles, but just for instance sake, if someone's anxiously attached, often someone, t the other person might be avoidant and they might pull away. If you can, if you are in a space where you can be secure, take, take some deep breaths, literally regulate your body, your vessel, so that that person can come toward you. Oh my gosh, magic can happen there. Mm. Um, so I yeah. would say that if you can use, like think of your body as a little vessel, a little home that you can invite the other person into. They are allowed to say no if they don't want you. <laughs> but if you <laughs> can be that regulated state, that is so incredibly helpful and easier said than done for, for most people, um, but can be really helpful. You know, one thing I, I will do with my clients um, who have triggers is I will have them assemble their trauma safety kit, basically, kind of like well, I live in California, but we have uh, earthquake kits here, mm -hmm. right? Because when, when the big one's coming, like you don't want to have to be going through drawers and trying to find things. Like you have your earthquake kit. I'm sure you've got your, your hospital bag that you'll be having yes. waiting for you when you go to the hospital. Yeah. But um, so basically you've got your trauma, your trauma safety kit and it's going through, okay, how do I know when I'm being triggered? Like mm -hmm. what, what do I sense happening in my body? what do I need when this starts happening? And it doesn't necessarily have to be one universal thing that you need, but essentially coming up with, here are the tools I know have worked for me historically. Here are some of the warning signs. And then if you are partnered, sharing that with your partner, yeah, being like, look, I may not be able to have the words to have the conversation to let you know what I need in the moment, but here are some places you can start and see if these work out for you. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, having, having the preemptive planning in mind, if you can, but, um, as somebody who I will have triggers come up when I least expect them, um, in situations that I've done multiple times before where they haven't been issues at all, mm -hmm. um, not, not everything can be pre-planned, nope. but if you know that there's a chance that you are going to enter into some sort of stress or trauma response while you're in the bedroom, um, at least giving your partner whatever tools you think might be able to support you best preemptively is good in the event that you're not able to articulate that in the moment. Mm -hmm. And one thing that might help too, and that's been really helpful for me, not, not just in the bedroom, but just in general with kind of triggering content with, with, within partnership is find a mm -hmm. code word. You know, it's different from your code word of like, like we need to stop sex. Like a safe word. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. It's different than that. But think of it as like, like something that's just going to jolt you right out of it. Like it's just like purple unicorn or something ridiculous. Again, I come from a humor side point side of things. Yeah. So I always like to that in, but that might be something that if you've had the preemptive conversation in the moment, it can feel really hard to feel like I'm anxious and I want to stop. Like sometimes saying no, is hard. If you're a woman, <laughs> at least that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. It's like, I have had to learn how to say no. And so what helped me was instead of saying no, was to be like, you know, yellow duck, <laughs> you know, yep. and that just stopped yep. everything. And then they yeah. can go straight into their place of like, okay, I can co-regulate. I can be here with you and, and go from there. And because it is hard to access your words sometimes when you're feeling dysregulated. So sometimes just having that quick word is, is helpful. Yes. I love that. And it's funny you said yellow duck. Cause, cause some people will say red, yellow, green in the bedroom, like right. green, like this is all good, especially if you're doing a little bit of power play and, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yellow duck, it, it come up with whatever words you want. I tell people when it comes to, to safe words, if we are talking about, you know, sex and kink and role play, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be too wild. 
your safe word can literally be safe word. Right. Right. <laughs> Um, your, you can find a word or perhaps, you know, you touch a part of your body, you tap a part of your body five times or whatever the, the, the case may be, but, um, but having that plan in place, I love it, Kat, that perhaps you don't even have the words to say, I'm being triggered right now. It's yellow duck. Yeah. And that is, um, essentially the emotional safe word. Totally. For both I could also you. be just stop. <laughs> which is a good yeah. one too. <laughs> but unless again, that's part of your play and you don't want to say that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I <laughs> stop me like, do, <laughs> do I share this story or not? Do I share the story about the time that, <laughs> that we, we almost uh, got kicked out from the sex club because I said, stop. And people around us didn't realize this was like part of our role play. We were uh, doing. Anyway, the stop meant keep like, going. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then we're like, you know, in the heat of the moment, and we, we hear these like two people off to the side talking and one of, this woman turns to her partner and says, oh my God, did she just say stop? And we're like, oh God, no, 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 no. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> like, I'm not being violated right now. This but is what anyway, I mean. This is in the beginning yeah. days. Yeah. This is why exactly. it's like sometimes exactly. yellow duck is the best word because it's so out there and means nothing <laughs> usually. Exactly. So. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for, for being here today. And um, I know that you have a wait list right now, Yes. but if people do want to connect with you, how can they do that, Kat? Yeah. Um, either through TikTok or Instagram, it's Kat Kieran's on both of them. Um, you can also check out my website too. Um, but yeah, sign up for my wait list uh, if you would like either coaching or therapy in 2024. I might open it up in 2023. We'll decide. I'm just going to decide with baby and see who comes out of me. All right. Well, in the meantime, find all of her valuable content on the interwebs. And if you're looking for some support when it comes to intimacy, sex, and relationships, you can find me at renamartine.com or on Instagram underscore Rena dot Martine underscore. Thank you so much, Kat. And I wish you a safe, smooth, and beautiful delivery. And I can't wait to see the photos of your little babes. Aw, thank you so much for having me, Rena. Thank you. I hope that episode was helpful. Hey, listen, if you want to share your singlehood journey, if you've gone somewhere, come back. If you have revelations and wisdom, please share your story. It's going to help other people. Nothing makes us feel more connected than hearing other people's stories. So just send me the audio of your story and you could just record it directly from your phone and email it to theangrytherapist at gmail.com. Also, if you want our Single on Purpose newsletter, go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life. You will get tools and articles and other people's stories and also uh, Zoom links to private gathers. So if you want to join our community, go to singleonpurpose.life. Thank you for listening. Be well. We hope you tell a friend. Hey, before you go, I want to invite you to the Single on Purpose private community online. It's off of social media. No ads, no algorithms. We got forums. We got live groups. We got webinars. And we have social hangs. We also have offline in-person hangs happening soon. So check us out. Go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life. And I will see you inside.